Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's IIED debates event. So today we are going to be discussing uh, COP26 and the outcomes and where we go from here. Uh, we've got a fantastic panel lined up. They'll be introduced shortly. Um, I am certainly very excited to hear their insights and perspectives on COP26. So with that, I am really delighted to hand over to Andrew Norton, who is the director of IIED and our moderator for today's discussion. Andy, over to you, please. Thanks so much, Juliet, and it's really exciting to be here with this um, really great panel, who I will introduce in a moment. Um, yeah, I'm director of IAD, and it's my great pleasure to be moderating this event. So a warm welcome to you all. It's wonderful to see so many of you here um, and wanting to be part of the discussion. And um, as Juliet was saying, please do use the chat to introduce yourself. But if you have any specific questions to pick up in the second half of the discussion, please put them in the Q&A panel. So it's not far off a couple of weeks now since COP26 wrapped up, and I hope those of you who are there have had the chance to recover, to catch your breath, and to reflect a little on um, what was an extraordinary event with an extraordinary run-up as well. Um, the world is dealing with multiple crises. The climate crisis, um, a crisis of unprecedented biodiversity loss on a global scale, rising inequalities, and this last one very much exacerbated and driven in all kinds of new ways um, by the global COVID-19 pandemic over the last couple of years. Um, and the way we see it, strong and urgent action is needed to address these interconnected crises. And this has been an important year to step up. And the decisions taken by leaders um, during the coming year as well will be vitally important. Um, there's a huge to-do list coming out of COP26 for COP27 in terms of climate negotiations um, and other aspects of climate action um, that will shape this critical next decade on climate, nature and development. So COP26 was a major milestone. And while there's no doubt that in some areas we move forward, um, many are asking if it went far enough and there are many areas we'll be exploring where follow-up action over the next year will really be needed in order to deliver on the areas where progress was made and the promise of Glasgow. Um, there were also a huge range of outcomes outside of the formal negotiations themselves that probably won't be a particularly fo particular focus of this discussion. Um, things like the Glasgow Declaration on Forests and Land Use that aims to direct almost $20 billion to halt and reverse forest loss and land degradation by 2030. That could be a big step forward if it's delivered on. Also worth mentioning the Indigenous Peoples and Local Communities Forest Tenure Joint Donor Statement that promises $1.7 billion to advance land tenure and resource tenure rights for Indigenous peoples and local communities. Again, that could be a really significant development if it's delivered on. Um, but I counted on the COP presidency website some 30 um, outcome declarations which were kind of off to the side or separate from the main business of the negotiation. So there's much um, as yet that we need to find out about what that really means and how it will roll forward. Um, and we need to make sure, of course, that promises are kept um, and that they represent important developments in the journey towards strong climate action. Um, we saw the progress made at Glasgow, but it is fragile. And from this point on, uh, the momentum really needs to build. Today, our discussion will focus on the outcomes of the negotiations, as I was saying, the level of ambition and played, so and to what extent the outcomes respond to the priorities of the 46 least developed countries, the LDCs. We will look at where we go from here and what the road to COP27 should look like. And that's what our fantastic panel of speakers are here to discuss. So let me introduce them again quickly. Uh, Mamadou Honadia is Water and Forestry Conservator in Burkina Faso's Environment Ministry and the former UNF C Head of Delegation for Burkina Faso. Um, Mamadou, we're delighted to have you here with us and speaking to us from Ouagadougou. That's brilliant. Um, we have 
delighted to welcome Tara Shine, um, who's a very experienced policy advisor and climate negotiator, director and co-founder of the Social Enterprise Change by Degrees, and chair, um, um, very honored to have her as chair of the Board of Trustees for IIED. Um, Tara, you're very welcome. It's brilliant to have you with us. And our third panelist is Madeleine Dussard, who is head of the Ch Climate Change Division in the Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development of Senegal, and is also the incoming chair of the LDC negotiating group in the climate negotiations. Um, it's wonderful to have you with us, Madeleine. So we'll now move to the panel discussion. Um, we'll take 20 to 25 minutes over this, and then we'll have some time for taking questions from the audience, and we'll be monitoring the Q&A for that in particular. So let me start by asking our three panelists for a very brief, like a one minute reflection on the COP outcomes. How did it work for you? What did you see as the most important things that came out of Glasgow? Madeleine, can I start with you? Hello, yes, thank you. Thank uh, EID for uh, organizing this uh, important uh, event coming from uh, the COP26, uh, uh, just uh, to have uh, 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 a global uh, uh, view on uh, where we come from, with uh, outcome from the COP26. Uh, just uh, to say that, yes, I think uh, there was some um, uh, step that was been uh, 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 finalized here in, uh, in uh, from Glasgow, and I think uh, the issue uh, related to the transparency, uh, the issue related to the, uh, the, the rule regarding the Article uh, Six uh, under the uh, Pariah Agreement, uh, and also the issue regarding. Um, uh, starting working on uh, on the adaptation goal uh, uh, issue, uh, also considering lost and damage uh, uh, in a more uh, concrete. We have touched on the issue relating to finance, in particular adaptation finance. So I think there was some key uh, uh, important milestone that was been uh, 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 that was been um, successfully. Completed in Glasgow. So I think this was something good. And also, there was, and I have to work on the coming years. And uh, also, regarding the, the, the lost and Thank you very much, Madeleine. You're breaking up a bit. So I'm going to move at this point to Tara and I'll come back to you in a moment. But many, many thanks for those introductory thoughts. Um, Tara, what would be your brief reflection on the Glasgow outcome? Oh, you'd think we would know that by now. It's so annoying. Uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, lovely to be with you all this morning. Uh, lovely to, to hear your reflections, Madeleine. Um, so yeah, I think for me, not enough, but signs of hope would be my summary. So uh, I guess we, I'm very, I know that these multilateral processes move slowly. That's because we're trying to get agreement, you know, in, in international law amongst 190 plus countries. So it is always inevitably slow. Um, but signs of hope, I think, and particularly in the fact that we will have countries coming back with new NDCs um, in 2022, trying to keep this political momentum to drive those um, the, the level of national commitments closer to our 1.5 degree target. And I think there's a greater acceptance amongst the parties now that 1.5 is the only safe temperature goal and, and that we need to, to do so much more together to get there. So yeah, signs of hope, absolutely. Thank you so much, Tara. Um, Mamadou, can I come to you now for a quick overview reflection what do you think was achieved, was not achieved at Glasgow? Uh, Andrew, I thank you very much. First of all, let me congratulate the UK. In this context of uh, COVID-19, uh, let's say it was 
really a challenge for UK in trying to organize such big events. So uh, on the organization uh, matters, let's say, uh, we can say it's a success. At the beginning, we were all suspicious. We, I personally complained at the beginning, at the entrance inside the conference premises, really it was very difficult. So at the end, let's say I have a positive assessment of COP, COP26. First, because we have succeeded in completing the Paris rule book. Uh, it's a conference we cannot satisfy all parties. So on Article 6, uh, we are not satisfied, but we can take it. So now we have a Paris rule book. That's a, a very good milestone in the UNFCCC processes. On finance matters, let's say we are also okay at 70, 80%. This is my assessment. It's uh, very good for us. On adaptation as well, we are in a process where let's continue talking. So generally speaking, let's say it's a success. I thank you very much. Glass half full. Thank you very much indeed, Mamadou. Thanks to all three of you for those reflections. Tara, the Glasgow conference was touted as the last chance to keep 1.5 alive. I think that's a phrase we've heard before, but it was touted as the last chance to keep 1.5 alive. Um, recent reports um, sort of aggregating everything we know about pledges as against emissions, as against temperature in terms of the science, um, emphasize the urgent need to raise national plans and national ambitions to keep that target within reach. What did you make of the Glasgow outcome in relation to 1.5? Where do we actually stand? Thanks, Andy. Yeah, and I think this is important. This is this understanding of 1.5, uh, what that means versus, say, a two degree goal and, and what steps do we need to take there is also part of this structured expert dialogue that I co-facilitate in the, in the climate change negotiations. It informs the second periodic review of progress towards the long term global goal under the convention. So basically, you know, what do we what more do we understand and are we using that understanding to make progress towards the towards the, the goals of the convention and the Paris Agreement? Um, and I think what I get is so I was a bit annoyed with this last chance to keep 1.5 degrees alive because I think that was never the job of just one cop. That is a job which involves all of us uh, and every government around the country. So the international process sets the direction of travel. It sets the rules and norms by which we will work together as a global community to combat climate change. But the action still happens at the national level. Um, and that's where each government holds that responsibility. And we as citizens have responsibility to hold our governments to account. Um, but I think what a very positive thing out of COP, and this is in the, the language of the, the political decision um, for the COP and, and for the, the conference of the meetings of the parties, is this recognition that 1.5 is the safer option and that therefore that is the imperative that we're working towards. Um, so this has become much more a universal language um, than, than, than previously. So that's a good, that's a good sign. I think a lot of the pledges that were made, the political pledges that were made in the margins of the COP really help us to get closer, not closer enough, as you said, Andy, maybe we started off at before the COP at 2.7 degrees, enough, uh, that's what the commitments added up to, now it's down to maybe 2.4, um, but that's contingent on all of those commitments being delivered, so being implemented and funded at the country level in all of these countries. And I think we also at that political level with those decisions, um, there are so many of them that it makes it hard to track. And some of them I found hard to understand who's in which one, uh, what's the baseline. So I think tracking those, whilst we have improved the transparency and accountability within the formal process, that was a big step forward, as Madeleine said. The, uh, we also need to ensure that we can track these political commitments 
because in the end of the day, the only thing that matters is absolute reductions in the greenhouse gases. And that happens within every country. Um, so, yeah, again, it's positive, but we just need to keep the momentum and keep doing more. Every year we, 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 we waste, uh, we, we make it harder. So, um, you know, it is about stepping up year on year, month on month. Thank you so much, Tara. Um, Madeleine, can I ask you a quick follow up on that? Um, perhaps if you leave your camera off, maybe the, the volume will work better, the sound will work better. Um, so perhaps you, you can do that. Um, the, a key part of the notion at the end of the conference that 1.5 had been kept somehow within reach, although it's a huge challenge and a huge stretch, was to ask countries to come back at COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh in uh, 2022 with new plans, new NDCs in line with the 1.5 degree pathways. Now, given that not all countries increased their ambition, either within their resubmitted NDCs and some did not actually submit NDCs for COP26, um, how hopeful are you that that will work, that countries will come back with a significantly raised level of commitment on the key issue of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, particularly over the next decade. Madeleine. Thank you, Andrew, and also thank you, Tara, for his uh, comment. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm positive. I think uh, the, the, the world is, uh, is uh, really looking what's coming from the uh, climate uh, change uh, 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 action and where uh, we, we, we're moving on. So I think this is something that we have to, to, to really um, uh, uh, um, approve and, 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 and look for moving it forward. I, I, I also think that uh, um, there is a necessity to, to build the ambition uh, everywhere uh, and uh, to show concrete action. Uh, with uh, impact uh, on climate uh, change, but also impact on country social economic uh, 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 um, profile. This is important. We have to show that it is uh, working. Is something that but uh, uh, doing some climate change action uh, is uh, is key and is also profitable to all of us. So this is something we have to to to. to to, to build and to increase uh, through the ambition. I, I also find, think that the necessity to work with a partner, I, I, and, I, and I think is we have to bring the business uh, uh, people on board uh, 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 to, to increase and, uh, and disseminate uh, around the world the, the best solution. All this has to be done not only in some country, but it has to be uh, 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 implemented in all the, all the parties in the world, in particular vulnerable countries, LDCs, uh, who are also part of the solution. And uh, and we have to really find way when we can where we can bring government, uh, 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 private sector, civil society uh, together uh, for this uh, ambition. And I do think that uh, communication is key, showing around the world what is working, showing the benefit coming from there, uh, from those solutions, I think is important. So showing success stories is important. And even if there are some maybe uh, 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 lesson coming from uh, some, uh, 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 um, some failure uh, uh, stories, we have to, to build on that. And I think this is uh, something but we have to, 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 to be more aggressive regarding the, 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 the communication. Finance is important, it's the key. <laughs> so I think uh, from COP26, there was some pledge. Uh, we have to be sure that this pledge will be uh, concrete, will be happen on the, on, on, on the fields. So this is something we're looking for. And I think uh, the communication will help us to be more, more, uh, 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 more concrete uh, in the coming years. Thank you very much indeed, Madeleine. Some great points there and the emphasis on just transition and climate justice in the action going forward is, I think, really, really important. 
Mamadou, can I turn to you now? I think one of the things that kind of hung over COP26 was the, the unfulfilled pledge by donor countries, OECD countries, to deliver $100 billion uh, of climate finance per year by 2020. That was not hit in 2020, will not be hit in 2021. The target is actually 2023, so it's lagging quite a long way behind. Um, what progress was made, do you think, in relation to climate finance at Glasgow? Um, not just on the 100 billion, but also the question of uh, adaptation finance and the gap between adaptation and mitigation and issues such as grants versus loans. Mamadou. Uh, Andrew, I thank you very much. Uh, the success of Glasgow depended also on uh, finance matters. Um, on around 16 to 19 sub items related to finance, let's say we haven't been able to, to complete one, which is related to provision for technical and financial support. Why? Because we haven't given uh, uh, sufficient uh, guidance to Jeff in order to help all developing countries. Because what we realized, some countries like Palestine, like uh, Iran, uh, until now didn't get any support from Jeff in order to, uh, to undertake the enabling activities, mainly uh, uh, national communications, uh, BURs uh, and other uh, documents uh, that need to be provided by, uh, uh, by national uh, circumstances, national countries. So apart from that, we, we have approved, we have adopted uh, all the, the rest uh, of the decisions related to, to finance. But now the problem is the contents. Items that are related to report from GEF, report from GCF, from the adaptation funds, uh, both decisions uh, were adopted very, very quickly. So now coming to the long-term finance and the new collective country five goal, where the two major items that retain the attention of the international community, and you will uh, realize that during the last two days of the COP, many consultations were held related to these two specific agenda items. They are very important. Uh, I was a bit disappointed by uh, our negotiating partners. When it comes to take a decision on how we can move forward, when we listen from some Annex One party saying that they will wish to have only workshops to discuss on what would be the next collective quantified goal, really it's disappointing. They haven't fulfilled the first target for 2020. So you have a responsibility somewhere. So now going to 2025, you would like a workshop to deal with such kind of issues. Fortunately, we succeed in having a work program with some workshops, but with also some other means on how the international community will talk together and being able to assess what developed countries will be able to provide by 2025. Secondly, is the matter of the gap between 2020 and 2023. There is a gap which is not filled. It was, this is really uh, an important problem for us. First, they haven't fulfilled in 2020. We are going into 2025, and there is another gap between 2020 and 2023. No decision from Glasgow deals with such kind of you know, uh, shortcomings. So we will continue to, to talk to each other 
in order to be able to to take concrete decisions, maybe in uh, in Egypt, in Sharman Share. On the other aspects, let's say on adaptation, we have a good signal. The decisions are quite good. We have to keep the momentum. So the international community must know actually that adaptation is our priority. And we got a very good signal from some parties, starting by UK, Ireland, and uh, other parties that would like really to invest on finance for adaptation. So I'm a bit positive, but what I would maybe recommend is to set up maybe a parallel process where developed countries that are really interested in assisting the developing countries for adaptation would find a platform for them, you know, to assist developing countries as far as adaptation is concerned. So I would not, I would like not to be so long on this. Uh, we can say broadly that we are satisfied at 70% uh, as far as finance is concerned. I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mamadou. Some great points there. The access issue is still really, really critical, as you yeah. rightly pointed out, and procedures yeah. are often too complicated and work yeah. to the disadvantage of many countries in ways they shouldn't. Um, but also this vitally important 2025 process as well, yeah. um, getting the definitions tighter, but also um, you know, the, the orders of magnitude should, be, should really be much, much greater by 2025, yeah, yeah. and that's extremely Thank clear. Yeah. So many, many thanks for that. Thanks. Um, Madeleine, in order to achieve just and equitable outcomes, it's important that we can hear all voices at the negotiating table, especially those of countries and communities at the front line of the climate crisis. Um, was the presidency's promise of convening the most inclusive COP in history fulfilled? Um, how successful do you think civil society was at um, encouraging a positive result from Glasgow? Madeleine. Tara, I'm, uh, Madeleine isn't coming in on that. I'm not sure if there's a technical problem. Do you want to take that one up while we um, sort that out? Yeah, happy to, but Madeleine, when you can connect, just talk and I'll stop talking because you will have much better insights into this than, than me. I know that in terms of inclusion, there were obviously some challenges that were COVID related. So some uh, participants were not able to travel from LDCs and, and SIDS to, to be represented. It also meant that some of the delegations were smaller. So a smaller delegation is a real challenge. It means you have less people to send into the different negotiating rooms. So therefore you can't be represented in every place, which means procedurally it's unjust because you don't have as much voice. Um, I know that others are struggling with quarantine. So from a personal perspective, the what people had to, um, to, to kind of sacrifice to attend the COP in some cases was, was quite huge. One of my colleagues, my co-chair in the um, Structured Expert Dialogue, he's on day seven of a 21 day quarantine on returning to China. So this is, he'll be two months away from his family um, to attend COP. So the personal sacrifice, again, is huge. And again, that won't work for women who are pregnant or people who have an, uh, someone that they're caring for, then they wouldn't have been able to attend. So you know, attendance is one thing, then inclusion in the rooms is another thing. So obviously this is a cause of frustration, particularly for many of the younger um, uh, climate activists who, who want to be heard and they want to have a say and they want to see what happens inside these negotiating rooms. But in fact, that multilateral process is bound by rules, which, which mean that everybody can't get in the door and even physically with COVID, not everybody could get in the door. Uh, but we need to find better ways of trying to get the lived experiences of the people most affected by climate change and least responsible um, in front of the politicians and the decision makers. So whether that's future generations, young people right now, or people living with the climate impacts in LDCs, in, in small island developing states, we do need to hear their voices more because that brings the, the reality. It helps to bring actually the emotion and feeling and, and, and 
lived impact of climate change into what can otherwise be very sterile and diplomatic negotiating spaces. So there's more to be one to be done there. But I would say that the the, the marches, the protests, the voices outside, the, the pavilions, the green zone, all, all of this and the wider conversation that was generated by COP this time is a really positive outcome from COP. It has, it has grown, more people are interested in it. And the pressure that is put on the process from the outside in is felt and heard inside those negotiating rooms. People do need to know that, it, they, they do feel it. Um, but yeah, it, we still need to work harder on finding ways to get the, the real voices directly in front of the decision makers so that they can't, they, they feel that impact and they feel those losses, they feel what, what, what it's like, because um, we, we have to bring more human empathy into the process. Thank you so much, Tara. Um, yes. Yes, I would like to step in because uh, it's a very important issue as Madeleine is not around. Because of I am here. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. I'm okay, back. Please. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Anaya, and thank you, Tara. Sorry. My internet is uh, not really good today. Uh, ju just to, to, to echo what Tara is saying, I think uh, the role of uh, the civil uh, society is, uh, is really key. Uh, and, um, and also, uh, as been said by the presidency, we bring, uh, bringing all voice in, in this process is, uh, is important. Uh, uh, I think, as we said by Tara, I think uh, having uh, uh, civil society uh, around will, will, will put some pressure uh, on, on, on government, in particular key, key, key leader. And I, I do think that this is, is something we have to, it's a process where we need all, as I say, all actors to be around. And uh, the, the civil society can bring uh, 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 pressure, can bring uh, ambition. Uh, can bring also innovation and also uh, also keep the equity aspect. I think also be something we have to, to, to think about. Be sure that all decision we we are gonna take uh, on this uh, big uh, uh, process uh, are equitable enough to ensure that uh, all vulnerable uh, 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 actor, all vulnerable country are also well. well, well well, well, well considered in the process. And also the issue of transparency. So I think uh, uh, these uh, uh, voice are important for transparency. And uh, I think uh, what we need is to see what the atmosphere is, uh, is concretely uh, 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 considering. So I think the transparency need be around. And I think uh, civil society, this voice, women, young, uh, youth, all these actors are important for the assessment and keeping us on the right uh, trajectory we are supposed to, to bring forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madeleine. I'm sure many of the people on the call from civil society organizations will be hugely encouraged to hear those words from you leading one of the really important negotiating blocks going forward towards COP27 um, with the emphasis on transparency, on accountability, on civil society role, and also on equity and, and climate justice. So many, many thanks for that. Um, Mamadou, if I can come to you actually on a Another topic that's of uh, significant importance on climate justice, obviously, and also finance. Um, a small but symbolic step was taken by the Scottish government when First Minister Nicola Sturgeon announced a pledge of two million pounds um, of, of operational money to go towards addressing loss and damage from climate change in poor countries. And this is a global first. Um, do you think this signals a political shift in the way governments will tackle, will have to tackle their historical responsibility for the loss and damage affecting the poorest countries? Mamadou. Uh, Andrea, I thank you very much for that. Uh, yes, it's a political good signal. Uh, it reminded me uh, the contribution from uh, a consortium of donors on life are air for least developed countries. So that's why, you know, in my previous intervention, I said I would wish to have a parallel process where those who feel 
that we have to do something for developing countries, let's find a platform to, to act, to take action. So what the Scottish government has done is really something which must be encouraged. Really, my congratulations. Loss and damage is one of the high priority for developing countries, whatsoever we will be saying. Adaptation is one thing. If the meteorological services said something will happen this evening, we can adapt. We will take some measures in order to adapt. Despite the means we will gather in order to adapt, something will happen after the events. That's where loss and damage come on board. So now, we have, how I call it, lives. We have investments that are destroyed, lives that are lost. How could we manage this? I think maybe the mistake we have done was in Paris when we accepted this article in the Paris Agreement. So now we are all fighting to get something for loss and damage because without any funding mechanism, really we are lost. So what the Scottish government has done should be encouraged. And from this platform, I really wish to invite the international communities, mainly annex one communities, really to advocate for loss and damage. It will assist a lot. It will help us to recover a bit. So it's a very good political signal. And I hope that our plea will be really understood by others. I thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much, Mamadou. And if I can be forgiven for a moment, there's a piece we've produced this year from IID looking at case studies of ways in which um, loss and damage can be addressed effectively and operationally on the ground. Um, so I'd encourage people to look that up as well. But it's a fast moving debate um, and the politics of this um, need to ramp up. And those are great comments, Mamadou. Thank you very much Thanks. indeed. Thanks. Um, my final question is, um, before going to the audience questions, is from Madeleine. Um, the negotiations for the global stock take came to an end in Glasgow, and the first phase of the stock take process has now been launched. How confident are you that the review mechanisms of the Paris Agreement will produce raised ambition for the future? Madeleine. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for this important uh, question. Um, regarding the, 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 the global stock take, uh, as you mentioned it, uh, we, we start the process so, uh, from uh, the November 21 to until June uh, 23. So there was a roadmap that was being uh, uh, established in order for exception uh, uh, to, to have uh, uh, some technical uh, discussion on uh, the DST. Uh, I, I think uh, 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 there was first uh, uh, the, the, some informal uh, consultation that was happened uh, before the COP. And also during the COP also there was some uh, 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 decision that was being come up from this uh, how to 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 to, to, to in, how to implement uh, uh, the, the, the process around the GST? Uh, I think uh, we also expecting to have uh, the report from the IPCC that's supposed to come on uh, June uh, before June uh, twenty two. So this is also uh, important. We have the first report, and we're looking for having uh, additional three additional report. So all these documents uh, will be helpful for the process. It will allow also country uh, to, to, to country and group of country to, to look at, uh, to have some key uh, 
documentation key element and also uh, to have uh, 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 enough uh, 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 product in order to, to, to see how to make this assessment. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, it's good to start assessing, but when you assess, you know, I think also you need to implement. <laughs> I think uh, the implementation also is something we have to, to do because assessing something, there is no implementation is also uh, uh, just uh, doing something uh, without having some, um, some, some ba base to do it. Uh, and I think the implementation of our NDC is key. Uh, uh, parties have uh, provided the NDC uh, uh, and uh, are looking to implement. So I think we have to have in parallel the two process. Ensure that NDC are ongoing for implementation. Uh, 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 ensure so that the, the, the global stock take evaluation, we have enough uh, product, enough uh, information <laughs> in order to assess something. So this is something we have to, to, to work on. So um, uh, my, 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 my comment is really to ensure that uh, we implementing NDC. We have an action on the ground in order to be sure that uh, we have something to assess. And from that, we, we're gonna see the, 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 the ambition. Uh, so what I'm saying is, uh, as been said before, is, uh, 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 having uh, uh, coming from COP26, action on the ground is needed. Great. Thank you very much indeed, um, Madeleine, and all of the panel for that, that quick conversation. I'm going to move now to questions that have come in from the floor. Um, and we've got some great questions as well to. Um, to take us further in many of the areas we've already discussed, actually. And in the interest of time, I'm going to ask each question to one panelist um, so that we can move through quickly as many as possible in the next um, 15 minutes. So firstly, um, from Ineza Umuhosa Grace from Rwanda, from the Green Fighter Organization, who we know well. Great to have you um, in, the, in this event, Ineza. Um, and I'm going to put her question to Tara. It's how can we ensure that we strengthen the vulnerable countries and communities on the road to COP27? Thank you, Inyeza, for your question. This is really important, yeah, because COPs are just a moment in time. They're a moment in time when the spotlight shines on the international process. And as you say in your comment, like, that international process is really important. It's why for all its imperfections, we need a multilateral uh, agenda around climate change because a global problem needs a global solution. And a, a problem like climate change that's so unfair, even more so requires this global solution because it, it, we can't get a fairness just by each country looking after itself. The fairness comes from us supporting every country to make the transition to zero carbon future and from every country being supported to manage adaptation, to deliver adaptation, and to deal with the losses uh, and damages associated also with climate change. So I think this is where the investment in, in, in developing countries, um, in vulnerable communities really matters. So it, it's, it's where the delivery of fi climate finance, of technology, um, of capacity building really, really happens. Um, and so there are things that, you know, IIED does, such as working with the, the LDC negotiators to support their capacity, to support the time that they have together to prepare their positions. That's really important in building up the voice of those uh, least developed countries um, in time for COP. But in terms of the, the communities themselves and the countries themselves, this is where the climate finance, the, the technology transfer and capacity building that we talk about in the abstract in the UNFCCC is so important because it is what actually starts to solve problems and protect people here and now. Um, so that's just critically important. Thank you so much, Tara. Um, the next question also from a very special partner for IIED, from Professor Salim al Haq, um, Director of the International Centre for Climate Change and Development in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And great also, Salim, to have you um, in this event. 
Um, and I'm going to put his question because it deals with loss and damage that we, we heard very eloquently from Mamadou on, but I would like to put his question to Madeline as the incoming chair of the LDC group. Um, what's your take, Madeline, on the Glasgow outcome on loss and damage? That's the outcome in the text rather than the, the Scottish government's um, path-breaking commitment. Madeline. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. And thank you for Salem for his um, question. Uh, on loss and damage uh, on a practical way, I, I do think there is a really a need to, to build capacity and uh, 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 capacity around all LDC's countries regarding uh, uh, how to better uh, uh, um, integrate. Uh, uh, lost and damage in a uh, national uh, process. I think this is important. Uh, we all facing uh, 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 some uh, uh, climate extreme events. We, we all uh, 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 see how it uh, having some great effect on uh, uh, poor countries. We, we, we need to show to the world but uh, uh, yes, we, we, we as LDC, we are really vulnerable. We are really affected. We, we, we lost a lot from a climate events as time. But also we have to show the, uh, what I can call it, uh, some um, uh, uh, ingenious uh, uh, local capacity of uh, adaptation. I think we also need to look at what what are the, 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 the effort made by these uh, the social happening on the, on the table and see how we can help them to, 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 to increase this effort, to increase the solution they put on the table. So I think also showing action uh, maybe will help a lot for uh, all communities to, to look at uh, uh, some concrete uh, uh, solution is uh, coming from an uh, SM event. Uh, this is something I, I think is going to work. I, if I take the case of Senegal, <laughs> we are having flood, and I don't know that Bangladesh also have uh, some concrete uh, uh, way of uh, of lesson uh, that can be also been shared around all countries that are also been affected by such kind of uh, extreme event. So we, we we need really uh, to 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 bring solution from the local process. So this is also something we have on the table. So this is uh, what I want to to provide uh, for the question coming from Salem. Thank you. Andy, can I jump in and add one thing to what Madeline said? I, I know I'm not supposed to, but um, it's just with this focus on capacity building, I think we also need to build capacity amongst the developed countries to understand how these losses due to extreme weather and slow onset events are impacting um, countries with less financial resources to respond. And I think building that capacity is something that we don't give enough attention to either. Just to add up to Madeline's point. Thank you. Uh, great points from both of you. Thank you very much. Obviously, this is an incredibly important discussion going forward, and there'll be a huge amount more action in that space. Um, it's one of the big follow-up areas, certainly from COP26, going into COP27 in particular, um, landing the dialogue process towards um, something more concrete on finance. Um, the next question is from another partner, very familiar, Vincent Ganey from FCDO. Uh, UK. Great to have you with us, Vincent. Um, and Vincent's question is about an underlying theme at COP26 of hearing local voices and incorporating them, empowering them in decisions on the use of adaptation finance, uh, themes on locally led adaptation. Um, and um, that was a really important element of the discussions and indeed of many of the commitments made on the side. Um, so, um, Mamadou, uh, do, do you feel that that emphasis on the importance of locally led action in relation to adaptation was sufficiently represented in the COP outcomes, in the text of the COP itself? Mamadou. 
so uh, I think the COP, the COP decisions present a lot of loopholes as far as uh, locally led adaptation is concerned. I think uh, we should at national level try to convert the decision into a national ownership in order to see how we can spread as much as possible the decisions at the decentralized level. So this is a homework national experts must do. We should interpret the decisions and try to explain how our realities are and what are the decisions, the national decisions we must be taken. Yes, we receive decisions from the international community, but we have to translate in another language that will suit our national circumstances. So it's up to us as developing countries, mainly least developed countries, to see how we can take advantage of the decisions in order to give an hope to the local communities as far as adaptation is concerned. So it, it, it will depend on the decision we will be taking. That's why we have to share you know, uh, our experiences. And I know that Salim Mulhuk is working very hard in that area. We have to learn with him, with his organization. And I know that in the next five years, some, how I call it, some outcomes could come on board and being able you know, to share with the international community, maybe at COP29, COP30. Uh, COP Thank you, sir. Thank you very much indeed, Mamadou. Um, great answer. I've got two more questions that I'd like to get through, and then I'll probably have to close at that point. And if you could keep your answers brief, I'd be grateful, because we haven't got that much more time. It's been a fantastic and very, very rich discussion. Um, Tara, for you first, a question from Christina Arribas. What are some of the ways you think citizens can keep governments accountable and make them act according to their promises? Tara. Thanks, Christina. Great question. Yeah, and I think this really starts close to us all. I think for citizens, you need to start with um, the local authority uh, in your area. So, um, in developed and developing countries, local authorities um, are now doing much more to integrate climate change into their local development plans, into their corresponding budgets. Um, and most of those budgets are, are available publicly or at least on request. So being able to say, well, this is what's committed to in our local development plan. And um, I haven't seen that happen in my community. Um, you know, ask questions of your of your elected local representatives. And then the same approach works for national elected representatives as well. So you can do this as an individual or perhaps even better is to join with an existing group that already has an interest in this area, but possibly needs more volunteers because everywhere needs more volunteers at the moment. Um, but you just ask these questions. You can ask parliamentary questions and you can ask questions of your elected officials. Um, you can call in to the constituency office of your local uh, member of parliament. All of these things are official ways and means whereby we can hold uh, our governments to account. And as I say, don't forget that that starts really quite close to you in terms of where you live and your local authority uh, and the plans they have. Um, so yeah, uh, I'd say get stuck in either if it's easier for you, write emails, pick up the phone, if not get involved with the group that's already doing this. Right, thanks so much, Tara. I'm um, going to come with one final question for Mamadou, and then we'll start Madeleine as the leader of the LDC negotiating group for any final thoughts on the discussion before I close. So Mamadou, this question picks up Article 6, um, and there are a few questions on Article 6, but I'm going to put it to you in a very, very simple way. Um, what do you think the priorities should be going forward? 
on Article 6 now that we do have a text and as you say we have finished the Paris rule book. What do you think are the priorities for countries, civil society and other actors on, um, on the question of markets and Article 6? Mamadou. Uh, thank you very much Andrew. I think we must start in preparing ourselves on how we will engage in Article 6.4, because on 6.2, uh, we cannot control the market that will be put in place and uh, facilitate exchange of, uh, you know, units between uh, uh, NS1 parties. Uh, if we start engaging, we will try to make things different from what we have experienced under the CDM. This is one. Secondly, we will continue advocating that we need share of proceeds from 6.2 in order to replenish the adaptation funds. It's very crucial for us. So, you know, from 1995, where the first conference of the parties was held in Berlin, to the Kyoto Protocol, we have listened, we have learned that we, have, we, we, we are moving from the environmental protection to, how I call it, to a trade. It's becoming a financial convention a financial process. That's not what we expected from, from this process. It's really something, uh, it's like a diversion of the discussions on climate change. We cannot focus all things on money, money, money only. So our negotiating partners should come on board and try to give a sort of humanism in our process. Really, there is something missing somewhere. So this is my way of seeing things. If we don't come up with another way of thinking on climate change, really it will be the uh, environmental integrity uh, 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 will be, will collapse. So let us start, let us start from developing countries on how we will tackle you know, 6.4, in order to have more projects, have more units that will help us. And we continue to discuss on 6.2. I thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Mamadou. That was a, a fascinating answer with lots and lots of substance. We're, we're slightly overrunning now, but I will ask your forgiveness to overrun by about five minutes. Um, and let me firstly ask Madeleine if there is just anything at all that you want to highlight from the perspective of the LDCs um, before I make some very brief closing remarks. And thank you so much for joining us, Madeleine. Madeleine. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I, I just want maybe also to, to use this opportunity to, to thank the LDC's chair from Bhutan, I think. Uh, the team of Bhutan under his leadership have uh, made a great uh, 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 job uh, for uh, 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 guiding the LDC's uh, group of negotiation and also for increasing the capacity among LDC's uh, 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 delegate and LDC's countries. I think uh, we, we, we want to be really grateful to him. Uh, I just want also to, to use this opportunity to thank all partners who have worked in order to, 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 to support, to assist the LDCs uh, to make their voice well uh, known uh, around the world. And I think LDCs became a really uh, 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 important group in this uh, negotiation process and even in the uh, the, the, the implementation of part of the climate change. So uh, my, my point is, yes, we, we, we need to go on action, on action uh, 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 pathway. So how we can help LDC 
to 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 be part of a solution to to play a role in the process uh, uh, at the implementation level and i think i am saying also Wait, that when you implement you you increase your capacity mm. so we we need to okay, implement okay. learning by yeah, doing is key so uh, i am looking for really working with all partner and all ldc's countries and all actors uh, to see how we can really uh, uh, go in an uh, action uh, uh, process for the coming years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madeleine. Um, I'm going to wrap up now. Um, huge thanks to our panel for being with us and for your um, really thoughtful and insightful contributions. Um, I'm sure everyone on the webinar has really appreciated that. So huge thanks to Mamadou, to Tara and to Madeleine for joining us for this discussion. I'd also like to thank um, all of the participants. Um, sorry to those of you whose questions I didn't get to, um, but I think we've had um, a really good discussion and we've covered a huge amount of ground. We will share a link to the recorded session soon on our website and by email, um, along with the resources shared in the, in the chat during the session. Um, I'd also like to give a quick plug now to invite you all to join IIED's um, regular, usually every two years, of course, delayed by COVID. Barbara Ward lecture, either in person or online. Um, it will be in London on Monday, the 6th of December. And our speaker is a fantastic speaker. It's Rebecca Greenspan, the incoming Secretary General of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, and former Vice President of Costa Rica. Um, who played a big role in a lot of the development of Costa Rica's environmental policies. And she'll be speaking to the issue of um, describing Costa Rica's journey to global climate leadership and what can we learn from a good example. Many of you will have seen that Costa Rica um, has co-chaired with Denmark the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance, which is a real cutting edge and, and really a global challenge to nations to move beyond fossil fuels. So Costa Rica still very much in the forefront of global climate action as they have been for many years. And if you do have, uh, Juliet will share a link in the chat for that event. And if you do have a minute, we'd be hugely grateful if you would share your feedback on the event by clicking on the link in the chat box uh, to do a simple survey. And with that, I will close this webinar and say huge thank you again to everyone. Thank you very much.